Welcome to Virginia. It's the birthplace of wine in America. Vine planting started in Virginia in the 1600s and has ties to the earliest days of the United States. Since then, family-owned wineries and persistent pioneers have helped bring this state into the modern era of winemaking. If you've overlooked Virginia for your next wine trip, you're missing out on a historic, established, and storied area that's now one of the most exciting New World wine regions around. Welcome to Virginia, and welcome to Vias for Vino. Our journey starts in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is about 70 miles northwest of Virginia's capital, Richmond, and 100 miles southwest of America's capital, Washington, D.C. Welcome to Charlottesville. This town has a lot to see and do. First off, it's got history. Three American presidents called Charlottesville home, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. It's home to the University of Virginia, part of which was designed by Thomas Jefferson himself. There are a ton of amazing breweries, and fun fact, it's where Dave Matthews Band got its start. Most importantly though, it's a great jumping off point to explore the wine scene in Virginia, which is known as the birthplace of American wine, though it hasn't been without its challenges. Virginia wine is a story of 400 years of persistence. The first plantings in Virginia can be traced back to 1609, when early settlers attempted to make wine with the native vines of the region. But they quickly found that American vines produced poor wine compared to their Vitus vinifera European counterparts. So in 1619, in Jamestown, Act 12 was passed, which required every male household to plant 10 vines of imported Vitus vinifera vines from Europe. There was a lot of hope that the colonies could export wine from the New World, as it was called, back to England, who couldn't really grow their own wine. But as we know, Winemaking is a labor of love, and they simply couldn't coerce the settlers by force into making wine. The conditions were tough, rainy and humid, and phylloxera, a root louse that attacks and kills European vines, was present everywhere. The wine they did make was described as foxy and musty, and the colonies ended up importing more wine than they exported, which was the opposite of the plan. The colonists switched their main export to tobacco, a much easier crop to grow. A hundred years pass and enter the third U.S. president, Thomas Jefferson. His handprint is all over Virginia, and this rotunda behind me at the University of Virginia was actually designed by him. Jefferson loved European wines, and it was his life's goal to produce high-quality vines on his estate, Monticello. He was convinced Virginia could make wines just as good as in Europe. In the late 1700s, he started the Virginia Wine Company and he ran all sorts of experiments in his estate on the vineyards. He spent much of the rest of his life trying to produce high quality wines, but unfortunately, phylloxera and freezing temperatures were problems he just couldn't figure out solutions to. While he may not have been successful, Thomas Jefferson was the first real champion of fine wine in the US and many attribute his belief in this area as the catalyst for Virginia wine. While Jefferson's vision for the region is often recognized, there's an additional part to this story. Jefferson owned slaves. Those enslaved people worked the land at Monticello, and their contributions are an undeniable part of Virginia wine history. The next attempt at Virginia winemaking was in the 1800s by Dr. Daniel Norton. He created a hybrid grape, now called Norton, that actually saw moderate success. It was a little grape that could, it was resistant to pests and could stand up to harsh Virginia weather. So by the end of the 1800s, Virginia was finally producing a large amount of palatable table wine. But alas, soon came the Civil War, Prohibition, and the Great Depression. All that great progress was lost, the vines were ripped out, and Virginia was back to square one. Finally, in the 1970s, a small group of six wineries figured out the trick. Most notable of the bunch was Italian winemaker Gianni Zoni, who you may know from Zoni in Prosecco. He decided to expand from Italy and bought a parcel of land in Virginia. Zoni and these early pioneers cracked the code of making high quality Vitus vinifera European style wines in the state. 
They were able to do this because Zonin brought along with him 150 years of family winemaking experience, capital, and one very important man, his vineyard manager. And that is who I'm going to meet right now. Gianni Zonin's vineyard manager was Gabriele Rousey. He figured out how to plant vines here, but more importantly, he shared that knowledge with his contemporaries so that Virginia wineries could grow from six in 1980 to over 300 today. He's now known as the father of the modern Virginia wine industry, and I met with him and his son Peter to chat at Greenwood Grocery right outside of downtown. You talk to anybody about Virginia wine, your name comes up. What happened when you first came here? What was the Virginia wine scene like when you came here in 1976? Six, yeah, at, at the time there was only one winery. It was very hard to find the great vines. And eventually I found them in Maryland. I would say 40% of the vines start to fall apart right away. No one, no one in Virginia was growing vinifera. No one. No one. Well, they no, were not on, a commercial, not on a commercial scale. USDA came to tell me to stop doing what I was doing. They said, look, I mean, you have lost, you know, half of your vines. So why do you want to plant European vines if they don't grow here? The following year, we uh, bought some rootstock. We bought some buds and we grafted on ourselves with the Omega uh, graft, right? And the picture changed completely because the first year I planted the, the vine that I grafted, I lost 1% of the vine oh, wow. instead of 40%. Wow. So it made, it made a big... A big uh, yeah, I mean, that's the difference between success and failure as a region, if you're losing 40% of your crop. There was not a person who knew what he was doing. They were all reading books. They told me they were reading books. And they were dealing with a, a professor of university. It's very different then you having know, somebody who's then, done it. somebody who has done the job, right? Uh, I was uh, the one who had some experience, but the wonderful thing, uh, the, the owner of Babusville was sending me over the best people he had working for him in Italy. I mean, the last guy I, I asked, I hired a Monticello, said, when did you drive your first tractor? How old were you? Six years old, I said, I oh, good. Bring on. <laughs> and by the way, I heard Peter's got him beat. He started when he was three, right? right. Three. <laughs> <laughs> I heard he was, was he giving tours at the winery? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the people were telling me he knows the answer to every question we have. He already knows. You come here, now it turns from one winery, I think to six, to a couple dozen over the course of your lifetime. Now we're at 300? Pushing 300. Where do you see Virginia winemaking heading next. What I think is really exciting in Virginia wine is the the freedom of experimentation. That there there isn't like a, a set precedent. There's not like we're not known for one thing yet. We haven't been here long enough that people show up with an expectation. Why not plant some other things? See what what else is possible. You've worked for all these wineries, and now this is this is your project, your winery. Yeah, and my son are doing everything. And Viognier is one of those grapes that is just a challenge to do well, if I'm being honest. It's a tough grape, it's low in acid, right? So it needs to be consumed fresh, which I think you mentioned you love wines fresh. That's yeah, like I, one of your yeah, favorite things. I, I grew up in a winery, so I, my, my favorite wines are young wines. Young wines. Because that's what I grew up drinking. And I love with Viognier, and I get it with this, I always get this almost like juicy fruit bubble gum kind of character. It's yeah. the, you know that melon and the floral mixing together. Yeah. It has kind of a thick viscosity. The other tricky thing with, with Viognier is that it doesn't press well. Naturally, the grape doesn't, doesn't want to give up its juice, which I think is probably related to that, that viscosity, is that it has the same thing in the grape. I'm so happy, one, that you finally got to do your own project that you get to pass down to your sons, and number two, that you have a legacy that'll live on well beyond well beyond yourself uh, as this region continues to grow. So thank you for sitting down and spending a couple moments with me. We continued the family affair at Greenwood Grocery as owner Nina and her daughter brought out lunch. 
killer sandwiches, all freshly prepared to order, and some insanely good like lentil that may soup. Be one of the best lentil it had soup chunks I've ever of had. smoked ham in it, and the stock there had to be homemade. The store is great too. All sorts of native Virginian products like candles, chocolates, and candy, coffee, cheese, grains, pastries, honey, and of course, Virginia wines. Gabrielli was your classic, obsessive, driven, immigrant workaholic. I'm pretty sure at one point he mentioned to me his wife divorced him because he worked 16 hours a day. He told me he just couldn't stop. And lucky for Virginia, he didn't. Wine and cheese. They go together like, well, wine and cheese. Cheese production isn't huge in Virginia, which is precisely why I wanted to visit Gale at Caramount Farm. In 2007, after studying artisan cheesemaking in Vermont, she started one of the only creameries in the state, 23 miles south of Charlottesville. So how did you start making cheese? What was the story behind that? Well, I had a restaurant career for many years. I ran kitchens. At some point, decided that I wanted to have a parallel universe where I still stayed in food. I grew up on a farm in North Carolina, and we had goats because my father wanted um, to drink goat milk. Okay. And so I was probably an adolescent at the time, and he said, you're going to milk them. Started with two. Two grew to four. Four grew to 14. <laughs> <laughs> How many do you have now? Um, well, we milk around 85. Wow, okay, yeah, so this is an that, operation. That's not that much. Where are we going? Are we going this way? We're going here. Oh, see, I'm going the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> I was just talking. You, you lead me. Okay, so we focus a lot on animal management here. We don't, stress is really the, the, the killer of productivity uh, for all of us, really. But every year I train the next generation. These are my yearlings. These are goats that are very young and they get like used to people touching their udders. Okay. They get used to the idea that they're very full and that, you know, relief comes in the form of human contact and feeding them. That they know that you are the, you know, we like this lady. Right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah, it's very full. Yeah. It feels like a water balloon. Yeah, that's a lot of milk. There's the milk. It was time I earned my keep on this here farm. Gail made it look so easy. Grab and go, if you will. Her name is Sidey. Sidey. Because she walks a little sideways. <laughs> <laughs> Me? It was a bit tough to get the rhythm. Luckily, Sidey didn't seem to mind. Right. And because she's not a kicker. Okay, well that's good. I don't want to get kicked. <laughs> yeah, this is actually very therapeutic. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> it's hard to, you're making it hard to get this one, girl. My wrists are, you know, you start to feel it after a while. The grip strength. I'm sweating. Uh, see, this is the difference between the, the amateur and the pro. You uh, know, I'm playing Little League and she, she's in the MLB. A good producing goat will give about, my goats, we shoot for a gallon a day the first year. A gallon a day, I mean, that is wild. I got the full VIP treatment. I got to see how the sausage, or cheese, is made. It's simple. Salt, milk, rennet, culture, and time. That's it. It's so complex. It's exacting. Temperatures, timing, and ingredients are all meticulously chosen to lead to this. Wow. <laughs> this looks beautiful. Uh, can I give props to Sarah for putting this together? She's your cheesemonger, right? Yes, yes. She's right over there, and she did such an amazing Dazzling. job. Dazzling. I don't even understand how what I made turned into this. Let's start with cider. I love a good cider. Mm -hmm. and I'm excited to try this. A lot of people, I guess, don't think cider when they typically think like fermented beverages that are in the wine-ish mm -hmm. space, mm -hmm. but it's made very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a lot of the same like qualities, right? It's terroir-driven. Mm -hmm. They literally say, on the bottle where they get their apples from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, traditional method. So they're making it the same way you would make a champagne method wine, but they're doing it with cider, which is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so good. These are the fresh cheese. I love the soft, fresh, bright, tangy, mm -hmm. acidic, creamy, mm -hmm. all at once. It is It like, is so simple. And sometimes the simplest things are the hardest things to do because this really shows what like you're made of, that's what your milk is. The Esmontonian is a hard um, goat's milk tome. It's amazing that's the same mm -hmm. milk because it's so wildly different. Mm -hmm. 
the difference in texture is, is you know, night and day. So this is the uh, Stinson Vineyards Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. Beautiful nose. Like exactly what I want from mm -hmm. Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. Kind of gooseberry, grassy, fresh. When doing salty or acidic cheeses like goat cheese, high acid wines like sparkling and Sauvignon Blanc work great. Plus, goat cheese and Sauv Blanc are a classic pairing that originated in the Loire Valley in France. These are ripened cheeses. So if that's a fresh cheese, or this is an aged cheese, sitting here in the middle of the ripened cheeses. Oh, wow. So much, so much flavor. It's made flavor of- Flavor bomb. Like, yeah, it, it really, it's intense. It's intense. It's like almost, it's earthy, mm -hmm. right? All right, so this is the Joy Ting Cabernet Franc, which pretty predominant grape here. It's one that you see a lot in Virginia that you don't see a lot of other places. Cabernet Franc is a high acid red with a medium body. I love it with the earthy, funky cheeses because you need a bit more weight and power to stand up to the more pungent cheese. And it's another classic pairing as both Cabernet Franc and goat cheese are historically from the Loire Valley. We'll think of, you know, paradise. They think of beaches always, but like this is a little slice of paradise. You drive up in here, and you go down these woody roads and then you're in this gravel and you don't know where you are. And then it just kind of opens up into this little oasis that you've created. This is how these types of products should be made. And so I, I was an honor to see the process with you and, and to enjoy some of this. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>
and blends with grape combinations seen nowhere else in the world. At the end of the day, Virginia winemaking is rooted in tradition, but defined by innovation. And let me tell you, that's something to get excited about. The winery that Gabrielli pioneered is one of the most famous and respected in Virginia, Barbersville Vineyards in the Monticello AVA in Central Virginia. I head there to meet with current GM and winemaker Luca Peschina. Another Italian immigrant, Luca picked up the torch from Gabrielli and helped usher Virginia into a bold new direction of wine growing, experimenting with new grapes and styles. The Gianni Zuning, the founder of this estate, in the 70s wanted to establish a winery in the U.S. So he went to California, upstate New York, came to Virginia. There were five wineries at that moment. The wine, honestly, they were, for the most part, undrinkable. But he felt that the climate and the soil here would have supported fine uh, winemaking. At first, uh, also, there was a bit of opposition, let's say, pushback from some existing vineyards saying that would have not worked. You know, they probably say, oh, here's this Italian guy, he thinks he knows. You know? Right, and they did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Alba, I moved from Piemonte to come to the, who knows, the Piedmont of Virginia. It literally is called Piedmont because it's at the, the foot, you, we can see the, the mountains. Absolutely. And so you're at the foot here. Yep. When I came, the region of Virginia was not yet defined and recognized as a, an emerging serious grape growing region. And myself and a few other people that uh, were able to create some great wines by the late 90s really put Virginia on the map. I think one of the very nice things is that you got to come here and be on the ground floor of an emerging wine region and really help define its story, which is something I think maybe you couldn't have done in Piedmont that's right. already very established. Uh, is that, is, that is very true. Uh, 900 acres with very different slopes, different soil profiles, which is what we really like for grape growing. And throughout the years, we had this uh, opportunity to discover the terroir and def define what we should grow and what sh we should not grow. The temptation at first was to plant the classic uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Cabernet Franc. Some worked, some didn't. Or Pinot Noir and Riesling, which they planted, then we pulled them out. Too, too hot. Too hot, yeah. So we really had to do a lot of groundwork, and we always share with everybody all the thing we know. It betters Virginia as a whole. Luca proceeded to give me a tour of the grounds. Though it was costly and time consuming, he said he didn't hesitate to rip out varieties that didn't perform. It was necessary for both Barbersville and the region as a whole to advance. The property's historic grounds are worth a visit just on their own. James Barber was friends with Thomas Jefferson, so much so that he designed his home an eight-room manor with a unique octagonal sitting room in the center. Though it burned down in 1844, the remains are another reminder of the handprint that Jefferson left on this region. There's a quaint inn housed in some of the old homes of the property, physician's residence, the gardener's home, and a cottage that was former slave quarters. This property was a plantation at one point, and I like that rather than erase that history, they acknowledge it. There's also a fine dining restaurant and, of course, a tasting room. One thing you notice, I mean, this is Vermentino, it's a grape typically grown on the island of Sardinia. Yeah, the island, the uh, Italian island, right? Yeah. So it's a grape that really does well and thrives in warm to hot climates. And I knew that because my father is from Sardinia. I like it, it's a great wine, it's very uh, almost salty, a mineral. Here you have a lot of aromatics that are center on uh, citrus, flowers, uh, sli even slightly aromatic to wine. Very drinkable. It's pushing 13, 13.5% at times because so, that's where you get the aromatics. You have to ripen it a little bit. Okay. See, a lot of times the aromatics come on the nose with the wine. Mm -hmm. I actually get a lot of it on the palate. I get a lot yeah. of the floral component on when you taste it. Yeah. And the length, it lingers. After a minute, you still have a taste coming. Mm -hmm. Slight bitterness. It is, which yeah. I like. Yeah. That's a great. That's a great thing for food, and it, it kind of gives it like a structure. I think it adds that finish to yeah. that length. It is fun to see that here. I mean, I don't know a lot of domestic Vermentino producers, so very it's, few. It's yeah, cool to see. This is octagon. The Merlot Cab Franc. It, yeah, and it's uh, and it's logical because we're on red on clay, and uh, clay clay um, does very well with Merlot and Franc, and not with Cabernet Sauvignon. 
Why is it called octagon? Yes, uh, this is the floor plan of a home that is here on the estate, designed by Jefferson. So behind octagon is uh, a very classic Greg Rowe and winemaking style, which has centuries of experience. Everywhere on the planet, when they say they're making a Bordeaux blend, if they're growing Merlot, this is the style of wine they're doing. Uh, Age-worthy, uh, we have still uh, wines that are holding through the late 90s. Uh, again, really aromatic, like yep. beautifully aromatic. A lot of spices, a lot of... Uh, a little smoke. A little, little smoke, yeah. So it's lean on the palate. It is lean. It is lean, yep. which leads to that, you know, nice acidity and, and some good tannin structure. So it, it will lay down. I think it actually yeah. probably benefit from a it, little it bit will. of time. This is a 13% alcohol wine. This is a 13 and a half, which for a red, especially from most American wine regions that they're used to, their reds will go 14 and a half and up and cabs will get 15 easy, 15 five. So this is a lean wine. And when we say that it's that bridge between the old world and the new world, this is kind of that, what we're talking about. After the cameras were off, Luca poured me a 2004 Octagon, one of the first vintages made. I swear, it was a dead ringer for great Bordeaux. I couldn't believe it. These wines definitely thrive after a bit of time in the bottle. I also got to try their Nebbiolo, which while different than Piedmont Nebbiolo, was that perfect bridge between new and old world. Peppery and tannic while still fruity. It proved to me that if you come to Virginia with an open mind, you'll be rewarded. Hey everybody, I hope you're enjoying the episode. I wanted to talk to you briefly about Vino VIP, which is our members only club. You see, we're a small team and we're completely independently produced, which means we can only keep making episodes with your support. So if the show has helped you or helped you pass a wine exam, or if you're just enjoying it, please consider supporting the small business that provided it and join Vino VIP, which is full of a ton of benefits anyway. You get full episodes ad-free, and you also get early access to all our episodes, including our YouTube videos. Plus, you get members-only videos like behind the scenes and commentaries and full-length interviews in our members section on our website. Once a quarter, we do a Zoom session where we get to hang out and taste together and talk. We do raffles once a month for our members, and we do a big yearly raffle. Plus, if you're a gold or platinum member, you get your name in the credits of an episode and all our members get access to our members only Facebook group, which is a great community. Membership starts at just $5 a month, which is less than the price of a Starbucks coffee. Everybody thinks somebody else will step up and support and their support won't matter, but I promise you it does. So please consider joining if you have the means and thank you so much to our existing Vino VIP members. Now, back to the episode. It was time to head to Northern Virginia, to the Middleburg AVA in Loudoun County, which is where a lot of the more modern wineries of Virginia are located. This is the fastest growing AVA of the state. And who better to show me around than my friend Renee, who runs a tour company in the area, complete with party van, if you so choose. What happens in the van stays in the van. <laughs> We are headed into Middleburg, a very historic town here in Loudoun County. Um, lots of great history, lots of Civil War history, art, shops, music, food. It's a really great, cute little town. Tell me why you started doing tours up here. What was your story? What made you passionate about this area of Virginia? Yeah, so we moved into this area in 2003, and there are only about five or six wineries then. Um, but we didn't even realize we were living in wine country. So in 2016, fast forward, the craft beer industry is growing, more and more wineries every day. And my husband had gotten laid off in 2016 from his job. So we decided instead of being one jerk's opinion away from not paying our mortgage, let's start our own thing. So we got this van, outfitted it out, uh, let people know that we were doing it and it's been great guns ever since. There's over 50 wineries here now, um, as of 2022, and over 40 craft breweries. And then you add to that the cideries, the meateries, all the drinkeries. You know, when people go for the luxury tours or the bachelorette parties, whatever it is, 
they, they go right to Sonoma or Napa, right. but that's on the opposite end of the country. So I get a lot of people from the Carolinas, Pennsylvania, Delaware. So we really are getting a lot of people who can drive here and realizing that Loudoun County is a wine destination. Downtown Middleburg is the heart of the Middleburg AVA. It's known as America's horse and hunt capital because much of its development was centered around horse riding and fox hunting. If you visit, you can stay at the Red Fox Inn and Tavern, which was established in 1728 and is the country's oldest continually operated inn. There's a distillery called Mount Defiance that creates all sorts of spirits, including house-made absinthe the old-fashioned way. There are coffee shops and markets, including Market Salamander, which is related to the very impressive Five Star Salamander Resort up the road. There's local art and trinket shops, including Middleburg Tack Exchange for all your equestrian needs. Not bad, eh? There's some great little restaurants, including Tremolo Bar, owned by Master Sam Jared Slip. I know this was the crew's favorite stop of the town. Pen con tomate with white anchovies, a personal favorite of mine. I play this game where I try and get our cameraman Colin to eat as many new things as I can in every episode, and I can proudly say I've converted him to a white anchovy lover. Flaming chorizo sausage, crab dip, watermelon with yogurt, and Linden hard scrabble chardonnay. Linear, focused, and concentrated with a beautiful acidity. I forgot I wasn't drinking burgundy for a second. Virginia was growing on me by the minute. Renee wanted to take me to one of her favorite spots in the whole county, Patamac Farms, located on the edge of the Blue Ridge Mountains, way high up, looking over the Potomac. When a lot of restaurants say they're farm to table, they mean they're buying from local farmers. But when Patamac Farms says they're farm to table, they mean you can see the farm they cultivate and get their ingredients from, from your table. <laughs> They're reservation only because they pick exactly how much they need for the night's menu from their certified organic land. Chef Vincent, yes, another Vincent, was born and raised on a Virginia farm, so he feels right at home here. Very much grew up on a farm. Just kind of always felt at home doing something like this. Running a restaurant on a farm has always been the, the goal. Dream. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really hard to beat it when you go out in the morning and like get figs out the door. Yeah. Like literally right out the door. <laughs> I felt like I was in the nature version of Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. The whole place was edible. As you walk in the restaurant, there were figs on the trees you could pick and eat. Fresh fennel growing on plants, sweet and licorice flavored. The garden had wild herbs growing every which way, not just rosemary or mint. Vincent must have listed a dozen varieties I'd never even heard of. Everything here you can just pick up and eat. You got all this shiso just growing around here too. This is purslane. Have you had purslane before? Mm -hmm. I love this. So this has more carotene than a carrot does. So it's extremely healthy. It's a great little herb. This is going inside of my ravioli tonight. Yeah. Is tangerine marigold lace. I know food pretty well, and you're introducing me to all sorts of things I don't know, which is really cool. Yeah. Oh, that is delicious. So good. Citrusy, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Like it's the wow. zest, right? You eat the flour? Same thing, yep. It's a different pop altogether. Yeah, a little more bitter. Yeah. But still really fun. There are all sorts of vegetables and fruits. These are some of my heirloom cherries that we got going here. Lots of tomatoes, lots of squash. Yep. Peppers are coming in really strong. Right over oh, yeah. here we got Spicy. our- Spicy. Yeah, our bell peppers are going. There were free roaming chickens and gobbling black and white turkeys. We raise our own turkeys for Thanksgiving. Chickens get farm eggs, which is why it's always on the menu. They're nice, I promise they don't attack. And then I got two ducks too. Okay. That is Steven. Go on. He's like, hey, Come I'm on. not listening to you. Go on. Listen to you. Let's go. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't really get any fresher than this, though. No, I mean, it's literally you're getting them and they're going on tonight. I do this, yeah, every single morning I come in. Eventually, Renee and I ended up on the gazebo, overlooking the entire valley, getting ready for our meal. Yeah, cheers. cheers. We started with plain old bread and butter. Just kidding, folks. Housemade gluten-free roti, sunflower butter, and a slew of fresh herbs that I helped pick. 
See, I do work for my meals. Yeah. He was like, yeah, try this, try this, try this. This is insane. I love this roti, that's delicious. Deviled eggs with house-made dill pickles and bacon jam, dehydrated Fresno peppers, and smoked trout roe. I'm the deviled egg queen. I am now the princess. <laughs> Both paired with Tremonette, a floral, tropical, and fresh white similar to Gewürztraminer from Barrel Oak Winery in Middleburg. Fresh light whites with green herbs are almost always a match. I like fresh herbs with like the floral wine, it's pretty fun. Next, the most gorgeous tomato soup I've ever had. Warm heirloom tomato puree over breadcrumbs, tarragon, green beans, tangerine marigold, and fennel puree. Oh my god. So like how do you make tomato soup exciting? Like that's how you make it exciting because now house made Japanese sourdough with local cheddar from Loxley Farm and smoked fontina. And to think, all these years I've been using plain old American on white. Uh, so Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. You okay? Need yeah, a but I'm <laughs> gotta dip it, man. Yeah, right. <laughs> and to pair, Boxwood Estate Cabernet Franc Rose. Fresh tomato dishes and rose are almost always a match, as the clean acidity of the wine matches the tomatoes. And the flavors? This strawberry tomato blend Ooh. that's like really cool. Those two are gonna be an incredible mouth party. <laughs> mouth party, I love it. Well, I cleaned it up, normally I say mouthgasm. <laughs> <laughs> Pan-seared lemonfish or cobia with charred bubba ganoush, caponata, and pickled red onion, paired with Virginia's own cult winery, RDV's friends and family. The seared cobia had some weight, almost like a swordfish, so a light red worked well. Well, the wine is lights out. Yeah. Oh, it's really good. As we ate our palate cleanser of honeydew mint granada and basil lentil cream. I don't think I've been in my life. That makes I could eat like 10 of those. I realized that I just had an entire meal with all Virginia wines, all Virginia ingredients with my awesome Virginia friend. No need to import from California or Europe. This was a homegrown fine dining experience just as chef intended. Because of all the rainfall and humidity, growing vines in Virginia can be a challenge. So mountain vineyards do fairly well because of the improved airflow and better draining soils. It's the reason the Huber family chose Hogback Mountain in the Middleburg AVA for their winery Stone Tower. And for anyone thinking the luxury wine experience doesn't exist in Virginia, well, see for yourself. This is an estate if I've ever seen one. <laughs> it's beautiful. My family's been farming here for almost 50 years now. Oh, wow. So we've been farming horses and cattle and that type of thing. And my wife and I, we raised our, our kids in the city. And we always said when we were empty nesters, we were gonna come out here and, and do some kind of farming activity. And I just started researching. The grapes are the new Virginia tobacco. And I said, you know, that's a, and I tried some Virginia wine. So I started trying some wines. The Octagon down there at Barbersville was yeah. just, that really turned me on. And I said, you know, if I can do something like that, that's really a worthwhile endeavor. Some viticulture consultants to come out here and take a look at the property. And, and they thought it was a great spot site. If it wasn't, we'd probably be talking about Wagyu beef or something okay, you know, right sure. now. But that's, uh, but anyway, great site for growing grapes. And customer base was, you know, a little skeptical at first, but I mean, we're really converting a lot of, a lot of folks over. Mike spent 35 years building a successful furniture company. So when the time came to open a winery, he earned the privilege of building it in spectacular fashion. A modern, sprawling estate with beautiful architecture through the tasting rooms and event spaces. Concrete eggs, stainless steel tanks, and barrels of all shapes and sizes. Not to mention killer mood lighting. I even got to see the private family cellar and their brand new state-of-the-art harvest facility where they were processing some of today's fruit. Eventually, we took a golf cart up the hill to our tasting. And there's a number of reasons why we have a microclimate that I think is somewhat unique here. So we're up on Hogback Mountain, which that's a geological formation. So we're surrounded by valleys. My, our, my guys here on the vineyard, they call it Magic Mountain. And the storms basically go around us. After storms, you can even feel it right now, we've got a breeze going. Virginia has a lot of clay in it, but because we're up on this old, really old mountain foundation base, it's very rocky. 
very rocky, very little clay. So by getting those rocky soils, you get some drainage in the soil too, right? Correct. I talked to Luca at Barberville and he was like, oh, I can't do Cabernet here. He's got all clay, it's too mm -hmm. hot, it's too humid. He's like, it doesn't work here. But you have this microclimate that would allow you to do a we little do. bit. Chardonnay is right over there. It's like uh, one of, we started planting this in 2009. The viticulturist I was working with at the time, I said, so what should I plant? And he said, well, what does your wife like to drink? <laughs> and I said, smart, smart man. I said, uh, she, lo she loves <laughs> to drink, she loves to drink Chardonnay, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so she has three miniature donkeys. This is her, their name is uh, Norton Rosé yeah. and Cabernet Franc. So we got little Francky. Do the other ones get wine labels or so far only Cabernet uh, I don't know. Franc gets I don't know. wine? They're, they're, Next co they're a couple little asses, you know, so. <laughs> 100% native yeast. Very good, so Eagle Park's concrete, new oak, used oak. And mm -hmm. you get that because you get, I definitely get some of that baking spice character, baked yellow apple thing going. So we, we do get our Chardonnay pretty ripe here, so I, I get a, just a little hint of peach here. I'm not like so much in like tropical land, I'm, but I am in like it's, stone fruit land. It's more of a medium. Mm -hmm. Down the center, again, I mean, we just keep playing with that old world, new world comparison, and here's Virginia smack dab in the middle because it, it is kind of a little bit of both. Okay, Hogback Mountain, one of our flagship wines. We're up here on Hogback Mountain, so kind of a strong name. Left bank driven, Cabernet Sauvignon driven wine. Fairly ripe, plush fruit that I would want. But there is on the nose this old world Bordeaux-esque quality, mm -hmm. mineral quality, like that gravelly, terroir driven, expression that you you don't get a lot of times from california wines they all try and some of them do but you get it a lot here yeah you get it a lot so i mean i i would call it almost like a graphite you mm -hmm. know type type um type thing that's going the on, one like the pencil the pencil, pencil. Top. yeah yeah and we but we have dark fruit in here mm -hmm. you know you've got some dark fruits dark cherry um I think you get a little bit of violet. I literally, it's funny, we did our Bordeaux episode last season and in my script, I'm talking, I talk about the grapes and I say, you know, there's a, a graphite, rocky minerality to Bordeaux mm -hmm. that I love, number one, and number two, I haven't found anywhere else. Mm -hmm. This is the closest I've tried to that. I'm, I'm pretty blown away. And I also got that from an older octagon in Barbersville. Like I'm seeing that in Virginia more than I see that mm -hmm. in other New World wine regions. Um, so kudos, I mean, that's really, really cool. And so the real question is, you know, your oldest vintage is what? You know, you... 2013. 2013. Yeah. Exactly. So you're going to get to see what happens to this wine as, mm -hmm. as it grows. Not only are you going to get to see it, but as an industry, everybody will get to see, okay, how does this terroir work for this type of grape? We try to learn a little bit more every year and have some fun with it. Yeah. Well, our, our mission statement here is joy in every bottle. Sure, okay? sure, sure. I have so joy So that's why right we, now, we so. want to have joy. So hopefully you're having joy. Okay, I have right. joy. You succeeded. Good, good. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you're a fan of the show, about now you're probably wondering where the Nerd Lab is. Don't worry, it's not leaving, but it is moving from these travel episodes to our brand new show, Vino First, and I'm super excited about it. While most people pick a wine to pair with their food, if you're anything like me, you start with your wine and then you cook a dish that pairs. So Vino First takes place right here in my kitchen, where I take a wine of the day, talk about it and taste it, and then figure out its structure and flavors and how they would work with food pairings. Get it? Vino first. Then we'll cook a dish from start to finish that pairs with our wine. Dishes that you can do at home. And yes, these episodes will also include everybody's favorite segment, the Nerd Lab. Look for Vino first on our YouTube channel and it'll be released in the months opposite our travel episodes. Let's get cooking. It wouldn't be a trip to wine country without a winemaker dinner, right? So I head to Field and Main, just south of Middleburg, for a meal with chef and owner Neil Warva, winemaker from Veritas Vineyards Emily Hudson, and winemaker from Walsh Family Wines Nate Walsh. Since it was our last meal in Virginia, it felt appropriate to start with bubbles. A Cabernet Franc Pet Nat from Walsh, fruity and fun, and a vintage Blanc de Blanc from Veritas. Serious and elegant. 
I didn't come in thinking, oh, I'm gonna have a sparkling wine in Virginia that's gonna blow my mind. And both of these are so tremendous. The nature of the industry is try, experiment, react, mm. evaluate. I mean, if we're not growing and if we're not figuring out what's doing well or not doing well, um, then we're not doing our job. Tell me about Field in Maine. My wife and I met in Tennessee. We moved to Virginia because it presented an opportunity to work in a nascent wine region and to be part of that experience. It presented us with an agricultural landscape that had farmers and artisans that we could support in the form of a restaurant. I used to be a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C., and I thought I could... Oh, you used I, to be in the, in the political I was, game. I, I was uh, at the Department of Commerce monitoring trade agreements and thought that... We're glad like, to have I, you on this side. I am <laughs> a thousand times more happy to be on this side than not. Thought that if I had a farm to table restaurant and employed 20 or so people and had a community of people we supported, I'd have a greater impact and have a much better time doing that for the rest of my life than spending 20 or 30 years trying to affect policy. All the food was from local farms. Course one, peach and tomato salad shawarma spice cauliflower sauteed and put over a bed of hummus with olives, feta, and pickled onions. And a Mexican street corn butter board. So this is our 2019 Petit Mensang. I know for myself, I don't know anything about Petit Mensang. I know it's from Southwest France. It's often probably blended there. So the high level is very few people know a lot about it as a standalone grape, the kind of price for really strong acidity, but also high alcohol. It can make a dry style, which this is close to. A dry Petit Mansing is a little bit of a logical fallacy, but you can get it close to it's it. Just, it's, like, it's like a jumbo shrimp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like a jumbo shrimp. Technically probably dry, right, on the sugar spectrum, but it doesn't, it has this um, still gonna viscosity, come yeah. it has this over the top fruitiness. Rich. It's very, very rich. Can't equate it to anything else I've had. Close to Chenin Blanc. Yeah. I was gonna say, Chenin Blanc is I think the only like a, thing. Like a Loire Chenin ages very well. You're talking to a guy who loves Chenin Blanc, and as the more I'm getting into this, the more I'm like, oh, I can't put my finger on what I'm getting. Yeah. And those are some of the most fun wines yeah. to me on the planet. A beeswaxy candle lanolin element that exists in Chenin Blanc. There's there's that stewed apple quality there. This is more about pineapple. Pineapple. And kind fermented of, pineapple. Fermented maybe. pineapple, exactly, and kind of grilled pineapple. What you're tasting now is one of the examples of among the best versions of this grape on the planet. And it's in Virginia. Yeah. Also, lights out on the I mean, everything's amazing, but the butter with the bread is unreal. Petit Mensang is really versatile, as it's one of the few grapes with weight to stand up to heavier dishes, acid to match the acidity of the tomatoes, peaches, and vinaigrette, and cut through the fat of the butter board, and a small amount of residual sugar to match the spiced swarma. The next course was a fun one. Crepinets, which is cull, a webbed pork fat, wrapped around ground pork with herbs and muscadine sauce. Seared, thick-cut lamb chops with baba ganoush, fairy tale eggplant, and harissa, crispy potatoes, and creamed corn bread pudding. You heard that right. Uh, is it weird that I'm most excited for the bread pudding cream corn? Yeah. Also, also known by a number of our guests as dinner cake. So yeah. no, go I'm ahead. I'm very <laughs> excited about this dish in particular. Have at it. So I have my 2021 Cabernet Franc. I adore making Cabernet Franc. I like to call this my Cab Franc Premier, which is like an early release Cab Franc. So you just get that beautiful soft touch of the cherry and yeah. fresh herbal quality. Because mm -hmm. what I love about Cab Franc is it's a lighter bodied wine, it is. it's low tannin, it's fresh, it's good with a lot of food, it can be served slightly chilled, and I get all those elements without maybe some of them super harsh bell pepper that some people don't like. I've done many, many, many Cabernet Franc kind of seminars and had the Chinon, had the Virginia expression, and then had another expression, maybe California, and people prefer what Virginia can do because it's in the middle of those oftentimes. If having a lighter, expressive, savory wine more often than not, you have a couple that sits down and she's like, I'm having the fish, I'm having the steak. Cabernet Franc. Great. Cap Franc. Yep. Let's yep. just do that. Totally it's not going to be a perfect pairing with either, but it's going to work with both yep. beautifully. And with the baba ganoush and the harissa, which is just like that really Jerk. earthy, savory, like, I don't know if you could see my face every time I was tasting, I was like, no, oh, I had know. some of the, especially Cab the Franc is just the best. Its earthy flavors match the eggplant and grassy lamb. Its low tannin didn't clash with the spicy harissa, 
and its acid cut through the salty, fatty pork. Our last wine was Veritas 2020 Petit Verdot, another grape that's fairly unique to Virginia. Petit Verdot. Yes. The the Bordeaux grape that nobody really cares about. Right, it's like 2%. Yeah, it's like, it's... It, it was in the wrong place. I mean, it's it's big, it's tannic, it's plummy, it's, uh, I think, herbal, and i kind of on the nose. And I only know that from, like, theory, because nobody does 100% Petit Verdot. Nobody's driving Petit Verdot like Virginia is. There's an opportunity here with the Petit Verdot to be one of the only places that, that does it like this. To go big, you have to go petite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is our big volume style wine in Virginia. So I know we started off saying this had a lot of elegance, but the layers, the flowers, the tobacco, and all the different aspects mm -hmm. of a red wine that you really look for when you want to have a long longevity of a wine. Speaking of longevity, Emily had brought one more Petit Verdot, a 2009 vintage, one of the first she made. The 09 is a remarkable argument for <laughs> Virginia red wine. Yes. yes. But also the age ability. This is so vibrant. Yeah. And it's just getting started. Yeah, it's just getting started. This is a baby. Yeah. At, at it's got 10, 11 it's got years color. old. I know. Yeah. I mean, you're barely even seeing a color change. For good or bad, right? That is one of the hallmarks of a great region is that the wines can age. How many wine regions do you get to go meet the quote unquote? the Mandavis or the Latours or the Rouleaux. How many wine regions do you get to do that? I come here and I get to meet the Rouseys and the Luca Fesrinas and Emily and Nate and Neil and these people who are forming the definition of this wine region. I'm honored to be here sitting with you guys and, hey, and being the, here. Be the next generation of it. Virginia winemaking. Thank you. Yes. So many of you who watched the show reached out and told me I needed to come to Virginia and now I know why. From those early pioneers to the visionaries of the 1970s to the friends sitting at this table, it felt like Virginia wine had finally arrived and that the future of Virginia wine was in good hands. Every Sunday, in addition to offering some of the best wine in Virginia, King Family Vineyards hosts a polo match. And let me tell you, it's an event. People dressed to the nines, sip Crozet Rosé and Virginia Sparkling, mingle while horses race the field and players work together to score goals. It's quite a sight. But more than that, this match brings the community and out-of-towners together. Polo used to be known as the sport of kings, but here and now, everyone's royalty. I met people visiting from Ohio and New Jersey and Pennsylvania. They all seemed to already know what a gem this place was. Made me feel as if I was simply late to the party. And there's no question what brought these visitors here. Virginia's persistence has finally paid off. They've broken in this land, never giving up on what some may have described as an impossible dream. They've tread through adverse conditions, mud and rain, to produce wines that people thought they had no business creating, until a rumble became a roar. They've worked as a team, supporting those who came behind them and together galloped into the unknown. They're excited about where their wine industry will go next, but also have pride in how far they've come. If you dismissed or doubted Virginia wines, you're not alone. Just know that these pioneers are gonna keep blazing trails in the wine world until you, me, and everybody else takes notice. I hope you enjoyed Virginia, and we'll see you next time on V is for Vino.
Hey, Vince here. Hope you enjoyed the episode. If you have a moment, follow us on Instagram. And if you really want to support, please consider joining Vino VIP on VSVino.com. It's our members-only club with a ton of benefits. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.